Um, your network that you drew where a large part of the brain got involved, do you, know, do you know where it actually starts? Is it the same place with everybody? What triggers the connection? Or is it random? Well, we think that when we first encounter a stimulus, some kind of, a, of an image, for example, that the visual processing regions of the brain towards the back of the brain first process that information and process it in, in, in greater and greater, more complex ways as it goes along the visual pathway, for example. And then that, that information then ends up in the hippocampus, that region, the first region that I told you about, in the middle of the temporal lobe. And that's the region that we think is crucial for encoding a new memory, for example. Um, and then that region is also important for when we're starting to retrieve memories. So it seems to be there is always a sensory pathway that goes from whichever the sensory processing area is relevant and goes towards the hippocampus for encoding memories. And then those regions in concert with the other regions I talked about are also very important for retrieval. Can you explain how some memories are deliberately avoided? For example, if you, if you dislike needles, injections and so on, is your brain able to determine that that should never be remembered? so that you don't subject yourself to a bad memory. If only that was the case. If only we were able to always do that. I mean, generally, we, you know, it, it, most scenarios, we are quite good at being able to inhibit, is the, the jargon, certain memories. So we can tell ourselves, you know, I don't want to remember that particular thing, and we, we are quite good at controlling uh, that kind of retrieval. But we're not terribly good at it, and it does break down quite often, and it breaks down more often in situations where we might wish it to work, such as when we're stressed, when we're, we've been experiencing a trauma, for example. In those kind of situations, our control of that retrieval, if for some people, is you know, very debilitatingly not there, and they, you know, the, the memory they would love to be able to inhibit is coming back and, 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 you know, and, and hitting them on a very regular basis, far more frequently than they might wish. So, Does that lead to some kind of breakdown? Well, I mean, it leads to things like PTSD, for example. That PTSD is, you know, is, an, is an example of where that kind of symptom is often the case, where somebody experiences, for example, a very traumatic event, and that's something they might wish not to, 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 be, you know, to be thinking about, but they're plagued by constantly reliving that event over and over again. And that can, be, of course, be, be, be very debilitating. Hello, I hope this is not too basic. I'm, I'm really intrigued as to how you determine what a healthy volunteer is. Uh, do they volunteer, or do you go out and try and select them? That's uh, a very good do question. Do they have to be a certain age? Um, do you take self-reporting, I am a healthy volunteer, uh, as read? Um, and is there any notable difference uh, on grounds of gender? So we recruit healthy participants in many different ways, advertising, and we have you know, databases of volunteers who have volunteered to, to, to come in for our experiments, for example. And you know, we're not necessarily particularly strict in terms of whether people can participate. We have certain exclusion criteria, like any you know, uh, scientific study does in this sort of situation. But generally, we're interested in, you know, in, in the, the variety of, um, uh, of, of these abilities that you see in the general population. So we don't want to be too exclusionary. In terms of age groups, we usually, um, in our lab, study people who are 18 plus. We study adults. But we study adults across the whole lifespan, so 18 to 100 plus. I mean, we don't have a limit when it comes to the upper, the upper age. And then the last part of the question... Oh, gender differences. We haven't really seen that. It's not something we've necessarily done an experiment where we have you know, pitted men against women, for example, um, to, to, decide to, you know, to, ex to explore that um, um, uh, reliably. But it's not something we've ever noticed in the data. We do have that data, and we, haven't, you know, we, we would have looked and seen if there was a major effect, we'd have noticed that. So I don't think these things do differ very much between men and women. OK, so we have a question over here, from the lady in the microphone. Uh, hi. Um, are there any advances into? thinking about how to use this information in a clinical sense, so focusing directly on like the anterior gyrus such in PTSD? Yeah, so I mean, there are people who work in that area who are interested in, in this. You know, is there some way, for example, if this region is so key for that reliving, is there some way of damping down function in this region and, and in other regions in that network 
that might perhaps help people to, redu you know, to reduce the propensity of experiencing those traumatic events again. So people are using, for example, that transcranial magnetic stimulation technique that I talked about to see whether it's possible to inhibit function in that region, to disrupt function in that region. And perhaps if you, know, if you have a... So we do experiments where people just um, have the stimulation once, but it's possible to have regimes where people come in on multiple occasions, have the stimulation multiple times to see whether it has a bit more of a long-lasting effect that might mean that when they leave, they, you know, they can have a period where they aren't plagued by those memories. And there's lots of research going on in that sort of area, for example. Okay, uh, there's a question here. So with the information on schizophrenia you are saying with the brain fault, I can't remember its name, could this be used like clinically? Like if you could work out which people have like a genetic tendency towards hallucinations, could that then be used clinically to try and work something out to stop them? Yeah, the parasingulate sulcus is the, is the region. I don't expect anyone to remember such a complicated name. Um, so what we've, we are interested in at the moment, this is work that Jane Garrison in the lab is really leading at the moment, is to try to understand the precursors of this effect. So this is a region um, that, as, as I said, that, 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 that develops in, during gestation, late in gestation, but, but, but you know, before birth. We think that the, most of the differences that we see between people are present very early on, either at birth or very early on in infancy. And so it might well be possible to perhaps start to discover something about the genetic influences of this variability, or whether it is uh, primarily environmental influences. So is it something that's happening in the womb? Is it something that's happening in early years of life that might lead to these or might influence this, this variability? And if we can start to understand that, then maybe it will be possible to, for example, to screen particularly people who might be at risk of developing psychosis. So if they have a first-degree relative uh, who has schizophrenia, for example, you can maybe screen those people early on in life, see whether the, the length of their parasingulate sulcus, I'm sure it's more complicated than this, but you, know, you could just see the length, from the length of their parasingulate sulcus whether they might be perhaps more likely to be people who are going to go on to develop you know, to experience hallucinations later in life. And then it might well be possible to put in place early interventions that could give them extra support to help to avoid that progression, perhaps. This is the very early stages of that. You know, we're nowhere near that at the moment, but that's sort of the pathway that we might try to explore with that. Okay, so there's some people in the gallery who have been waiting patiently. Um, can you see just the lights shining? But I can't see anything. <laughs> a bright light. Just yeah, uh, hi. so it's kind of back to the question about volunteers a little bit. Um, obviously, different people have different learning styles. Some learn visually, some audio, some by doing. Um, and I was wondering if you see the same effect in memory. So if people remember in different ways, perhaps they remember sound more or actual what's happening. And if you then group people that way as well. Mm. So, I mean, we think the latest sort of findings are suggesting that this idea of learning styles generally is a bit of an oversimplification. So we think now that it's more that some people learn some kinds of things better visually, but other kinds of things better auditorily, for example, rather than being purely visual or purely auditory types of people. And it's the same with memory. So there are some people who think, you know, who report that they remember autobiographical events primarily visually, for example, but other kinds of events might be more auditory in nature. And there does seem to be a lot of variability in that. So I don't think there's any sort of hard and fast rule about that in the same way that I don't think there is with learning styles either. Um, in cases such as PTSD, some people will like will relive memories. Some people will block them out. Um, how does that emotional trauma manifest itself physically in the brain? Like what areas are affected, and what does it do? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, so it seems that trauma or extreme stress, for example does influence the brain, and it influences particularly the hippocampus, so that region of the middle part of the temporal lobe that was the region that was so important in Clive Waring, for example. For some reason or other, and I don't think anyone really understands why, trauma and stress really do disproportionately impact on that region. And so they do lead to these memory disruptions. In some people, as you say, it can be that they have greater forgetting, they're able to block memories and perhaps block more memories than they might wish, and in other people that manifests as as you know, this, this, this feeling of, of constantly reliving these events that they might wish not to. So it is a, it's a complex sort of pattern, and it manifests very differently in different people, perhaps depending on the extent of the trauma, the extent of the damage that's done in the hippocampus. We have a question um, right in the middle, at the top. Um, hi. Um, so my question is, um, as far as I can remember in the slide, you so showed the parasingulate uh, sulcus. Very good. Well done. Um, yeah. Um, 
and you showed the defect, but it was quite a high proportion also of the people who uh, didn't have the folds, also in the general population. So I suppose not all of us are having hallucinations like a schizophrenic person. No, so, definitely not. Um, and then the second one is when you take, like maybe not in relation to this brain region, but are you planning any uh, prospective studies perhaps to try and figure out maybe people that do worse in, in certain tests that they go on to develop certain uh, problems later on in life? Mm. Mm. No, so in terms of the, the health of volunteer variability, most people have some parasingulate sulcus to some extent. So it's quite rare to have complete absence of the parasingulate sulcus. And of course, in that study, those were all healthy volunteers. These were all people, you know, who, who you know, have gone off and done well at school and, you know, holding down jobs and all the rest of it. They're all, you know, these are all as far as you can tell, typical normal people, whatever that might actually mean. Um, in, in, in schizophrenia, there's obviously a lot that's going on, and we don't think that it's, you know, it's purely down to the parasingulate sulcus. It may well be that this sulcus, and all that a sulcus is, of course, is a brain fold. It's kind of an absence of tissue where the tissue folds in. So it's not likely that this fold itself is likely to be particularly important. It's probably just a sign of something that's going on in the cortical regions that are surrounding this sulcus. Perhaps differences in terms of the connectivity between this anterior prefrontal cortex region and other regions of the brain, sensory processing regions, for example, or connect connectivity to the hippocampus. So it's likely to be that, you know, those variabilities that you see. So, you know, I think it's important that you all do all go off and try and get your brain scanned so you can see whether you have a parasingulate sulcus or not. But if you don't, I don't think it necessarily means you're going to be hallucinating. It may just mean that on these you know, very difficult kinds of differentiations between real and imagined information, you might just show a slight reduction compared with, with other people around you. Is the lady here? Yes, hi. I was wondering, um, how is it that a piece of music can be almost like a shortcut into going right into a memory which you thought you'd repressed, horrible things from childhood, and it locks it up? <laughs> And you're left with this chaos in your life almost because you can't put it back. <laughs> so how, how does that work? So music does seem to be an extraordinarily good retrieval cue in the same way that smell can be for some people. You know, some people can smell a smell they haven't smelled for 40 years or something. I mean, instantly transported back to their childhood. Tomato plants, in my case. My grandfather used to grow tomato plants. As soon as I smell tomato plants, I'm instantly transported back to his conservatory uh, when I was five years old or something. Um, and, and, and music works in, in, in a very similar sort of way. And so, you know, we think that what's going on there is that music, for example, and other kinds of very emotionally salient events have a very sort of preferential access to memory. And so smell is the same. You know, it's the, 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 the smell processing regions of the brain are very close to the hippocampus. The amygdala, the region that's involved in processing emotion, is right next to the hippocampus. And so that might be part of the reason why there does seem to be this very, very preferential access, if you like, to memories from those kinds of cues. Okay, okay we have a question. Where did you put the mic? Uh, hello. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm in my late 20s. I played a lot of kind of contact sports and kind of football and rugby and stuff from a young age. So everything's been kind of impact based. What is the what are the knock-on effects of having headed a ball and having been knocked out and stuff like that for, for my memory going forwards? Hopefully good. I, I, I'm not sure I can provide a, a clinical diagnosis in public, sir. You may not wish me to. Um, but if you want to come talk to me afterwards, we can maybe do a consultation. Um, I'm not a clinician. I can't, I can't diagnose. Um, there is growing evidence, you know, that, that, that concussion and other kinds of, of head impacts can be quite debilitating, can lead in some cases, perhaps, to uh, memory problems later in life. Um, you know, there are lots of claims out there, for example, for, for people who were um, American footballers or, or indeed um, footballers in England, um, that when... The, they used to use the leather football, for example, which used to get very wet, and then it was very, very heavy and hard, that a lot of heading the ball may be what's led to a greater propensity in those people for developing dementia later in life than the average for that um, age group. But this is a research area that's sort of very, very early stage. So although these findings are indicative of perhaps there being some kind of a link there, it's certainly not you know, in any way proven yet. And of course, there also doesn't mean that just because there may be a correlation between those two things doesn't mean that everybody who plays contact sport is going to be going down that, that, that pathway. There are lots of, bound to be lots of other factors involved in that as well. So it's certainly not a, you know, a straightforward 
you know, this is what's going to happen to you. We know we don't have a crystal ball. Um, but, you know, there does seem to perhaps be the beginnings of some evidence suggesting there may be a link between those kinds of, of, of contact sports, particularly that involve contact to the head and perhaps uh, uh, memory problems, for example, later on. Okay, we have a question up here in the back row. Hi, yeah. Uh, the vast, a lot of this has been about the disruption of memories, and you've done examples of actually causing disruption in examples. What about the reverse? Have you got any examples of enhancing memory by doing things? So this is a study we're currently undertaking in the lab, um, and the data are not even finished collecting yet, let alone uh, ready for prime time. But I can tell you that we are doing this. We are trying to use a technique. It's another kind of, of, of um, brain stimulation technique, like the transcranial magnetic stimulation that I talked about. This is another one called um, TDCS, direct current stimulation. And the claims are that with this method, you can not disrupt necessarily um, and function of a region, but you might be able to enhance function of a region. So we've been running a study, well, we are running a study at the moment, where we're targeting this angular gyrus region to see if we can improve, to can enhance the precision of people's memories using our continuous um, uh, memory task, you know, the one with the location and the orientation, to see whether if we, if we can target that region, can we enhance that activity, does that lead to greater memory precision? Now, this is a study that's ongoing. It wouldn't be right of me to, 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 to suggest what the results might show, but if you look out for a paper or go on our website in about a year's time, maybe you'll be able to find out the answer.